Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, I'm a developer. I'm an implementer. So uh, when I'm talking about web topography here, I'm really talking about things from an implementer um, perspective, um, which will hopefully provide you with some sort of um, information as to what's, what's doable and what's not. Um, and when we talk about topography on the web, I mean, you look back 10 years, we were looking at, we had a, a very small set of fonts that we could actually use in web pages. And so to talk about topography on the web is really to talk about web fonts. Um, and we're sort of, we're past the first phase of sort of better topography on the web, and that first phase was just simply having more choice. Um, if we look back in 19, in, sorry, in 2007, um, Hokum Lee, one of the original authors of CSS, wrote an article for a list apart, and he also kind of harassed slash convinced the Safari team to implement at font face, to simply implement it as, well, just load a true type font. Um, and that sort of sparked a lot of discussion, and out of that came the WAF format. And so today we have, oh, sorry, this is uh, one of the, one of Hoken's sort of hokey examples originally. Um, so we've gone from that hokey example to a play page like this today, Vanity Fair, um, uses all sorts of web fonts on their page. And in fact, if you look at the details, they're using 12 fonts on their, their main landing page. So we're clearly over the problem of no choice. And so now what we have to deal with is how can we make the best use of the fonts that we have and how can we improve or sort of work around some of the problems that we might have dealing with fonts as downloadable resources on the page. So choice is not a problem. So let's, let's talk first about just in general making better typographic defaults on the web. And that means for both platform fonts and for web fonts, how can we display them in the best way? Um, so let's talk about simply how, do, how, how does content get turned into glyphs? Well, I, this is all nothing new to anyone here. Um, the first thing is the browser will look at the font families and pick the first font family that exists on that given platform and then choose a particular face within that family and using these, uh, the font weight, font style, and font stretch. So it's picking a specific face to use. And then once it's got this font resource, it, has, it goes into the font and actually looks at the character map. The character map is what maps from the code points that you have in your content to actual glyphs. And then layout proceeds to work on those glyphs. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I'm showing here sort of an XML representation of what a font would look like, and that's done using this wonderful package, uh, TTX, um, originally done by a Dutch guy, Just van Rossum, um, and it's a Python tool that allows you to just dump out the entire font that you have and look at it, and you can, it, it's actually really helpful for a lot of times for diagnosing little problems. Um, so let's talk about how, you know, what, Let's talk about the simple way that some browsers will um, lay out text on a line. Um, simply, they're, all they're doing are taking the glyphs, measuring the width, and just like old metal type, just laying it out. Just one after another. So what's sort of wrong with this? This is a very simple model. It's going to work quick and fast, and that's the reason a lot of these browsers use it. But is this really what the type designer wanted? Specifically, let's look at the, the T and the O here, and the F and the I. These are sort of not really what a font designer was thinking about when he designed this typeface. This is what the font designer was looking at. This is, you've got kerning on the TO, and you've got an FI ligature, so that you don't find that these glyphs kind of sort of collide with each other. Um, this, is what, this is what the font designer had in mind when he sat down and designed this font. And yet, that's not necessarily what we're always getting. And this really should be the default. In the spec, in the CSS3 font spec, it is specifically, these should be on by default, but we're not really there yet. Um, these um, kerning and ligatures have been the default in Firefox since Firefox 3, and recently also in Safari. So if you have 
either an updated version, let's say 10.9 or 10.10 of OS X, or if you have um, an iPhone that's running the latest iOS version, you have kerning and, and linkages on by default. But unfortunately, Chrome and IE are not there yet. And this is a point where I should say, I should point out that you can pester the Microsoft representative about this. Um, he's here for your help. Um, but as authors, we can, we can still go ahead and um, enable kerning and ligatures. And, but since it's not on by default, this is something you have to do explicitly. Um, so for older browsers, for older uh, Safari and um, all versions of Chrome, you can use this text rendering property. This is an old property that came originally from SVG. It was intended as a way of um, giving author choices as to what to do during SVG animations. And it was kind of used in the early days when Firefox was experimenting with um, enabling uh, kerning and ligatures as a way of saying, okay, we really want the best that we can um, give you. Um, since maybe Firefox 4, we don't really use this anymore, but the WebKit browsers continue to use this. Um, and so this is one way that you can enable it. Uh, for IE, um, which doesn't support the text rendering property, um, from IE 10, they support font feature settings, which allows you to, to control specific open type um, properties. You can you turn on lig ligatures and kernings this way. And then uh, in once browsers update to the uh, latest CSS3, uh, CSS3 font spec, um, you can simply say font kerning normal and font variant common ligatures. That will get you the good defaults. So there are, there's a couple ripples here. If you turn on font feature settings um, for either Chrome or IE, um, they're essentially they're using two code paths. And so turning on one feature, no matter what that feature is, flips on this other code branch, and all of a sudden all of the defaults become enabled. And so here we have kerning being turned on, but bingo, we've got a ligature here. And so that's just something to be aware of when you um, go and fiddle around with open type features. So let's talk about sort of the distinction between sort of older fonts and more advanced fonts and the features that they have. Um, really, what you, we're talking about here is the ability to control the selection of glyphs. So you saw we had a CMAP that simply took a code point and mapped it to a specific glyph, we're talking about ways that we can control which glyph that you get. So in olden days, when you had a small caps, when you wanted small caps, you actually had to use a small caps font. Well, what we really can do easily today is instead enable the small cap feature, and that selects for a certain character the small caps version of that character. This also, uh, advanced font features also gives you a a better way of controlling glyph positioning, such as kerning, um, and also better support for complex scripts, such as Arabic and Indic and Thai, languages where you can have a sequence of code points that mean that the glyphs end up reordering themselves. And that's, it's fairly complicated, and it, it's one of the features that all of these advanced topography systems have. Um, the, the sort of original one, it's what's now called Apple Advanced Topography, this was, maybe 20 years ago, called QuickDraw GX. And this was what stimulated Adobe and Microsoft to create OpenType. Um, and then there's also another one called Graphite, which is done by a small company, and it's used for a lot of specialized complex script handling. Um, and these also have the ability to support locale-specific variations. So as you change languages, there may be one type of glyph that is used more commonly in a different um, locale. Even though the script is the same and the code points are the same, you change the way um, it looks depending upon that locale. And so there's this really great example of this. Um, this, this is a, a new open source font, Source Han Sans, and it's sort of, I, I guess, the first pan CJK font. Right now, um, when you display Chinese or Korean or Japanese in a browser, you're using a Chinese, a Korean, or Japanese font, even though there's a lot of shared uh, code points between these three. 
And the reason for that is that there are a lot of variations per locale. Well, Adobe basically sat down and, with a group of type designers, designed a font to sort of cover all of these locales. And the reason this is important is that uh, this project is being used by Google as a way of creating system fonts for Android 6. So these fonts will be available to average users very soon. So there's four localizations. There's Japanese, Korean, um, uh, simplified Chinese, and traditional Chinese. There are seven weights. And this is kind of interesting because usually in, when you design for Latin, uh, you have italics and bolds and uh, condensed forms and expanded forms. But in really in CJK typography, you really only vary based on weights. So it's very nice to have a, a much broader range of weights to be able to sort of establish ways of uh, contrast, of getting contrast within type. Um, and again, this is a, a coordinated effort of these three companies. And here's what this looks like. So this is the, um, the word for uh, Tuesday written in Chinese characters. Um, and you'll see the middle character varies ever so slightly. And the top, the, the top line is in Japanese. The middle line is uh, Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese. And the bottom line is simplified Chinese. And you can see that there's ever so slight variations in these glyphs. This is one font, and all you're doing is simply changing the lang tag. And because these features are built into the, the rendering engine, they get picked up and you see different variations. And this is another example of the, some of these, how these variations occur. Very subtle, but you know, these are very important to these people in these locales that you know, the glyphs need to look this way. You know, if you show a Japanese user or a Chinese glyph, they think, oh, what's this? This is kind of a Chinese font. And this also affects the punctu punctuation. Um, so on the left, the A to Z, these have been tagged as English. On the right, the kana here have been tagged as Japanese. And so you see the M dash here and the horizontal ellipsis, same character, but they've shifted their position based on the context. And that's just, it, it's a really neat example of how this can really give you much better control over um, fonts. And again, it's just, it's, as long as you do the proper markup, you put lang tags on, on the content, it just works. So let's talk about how you can get actually more deeper control over fonts. And that's through the font feature settings property. Um, this essentially gives you low level control over open type features. Um, it, it, it enables features if they're available in the font. So in other words, when the designer sat down and designed the font, he needed to put in the glyphs for this, um, for, for a specific feature. If that feature is not available, you simply get the default glyphs. And that can be some, in a lot of ways, different from the way many CSS properties work, where if there's something not in the font, then the browser sort of tries to fake it. For example, bold. If there's not a bold face on, for a specific font family, the browser will try and fake bold for you. Um, so the value list for this property is simply uh, a comma delimited list of these four letter strings. And so that makes the syntax kind of not very CSS-like. Um, this is how you would enable small caps, for example. Uh, you say font feature settings, and then this tag is the open type tag for small caps. And you can have a keyword, on, off, or zero, one, whichever you prefer, or you can simply omit it. That implies that it's on. And that's what's going on here. Um, here we're turning on the capitals to small caps and the small caps. And that will get you basically all of your, the characters in the line appearing as small caps. Um, you can also turn on swashes. Uh, this, you see, we're putting in a number. This means within the font that you're using, uh, you're picking the second variant. Um, so you can see this stuff, this isn't going to work across fonts. This is going to be very specific to the font that you have in mind. And right now the feature support is pretty much supported across the board. Uh, the little yellow uh, square here implies that for Chrome you have to, it, it's behind a dash WebKit prefix. 
Unfortunately, Safari uh, still doesn't support this. And this is sort of, you know, maybe going back to some of Apple's bad blood with OpenType, it's, they're still sort of reluctant to support it, unfortunately. But there are a lot of OpenType features. I mean, this is just a listing of A to C in the OpenType feature registry. And this really isn't like having all these little tiny features and trying to you know, figure out which one is the right for you is not really the right CSS way of expressing this. So a better way is simply to make the font variant property a shorthand. Um, so this is what you do now for small caps. Um, but this is now, in the new version of the property, it is now a longhand, which is equivalent to this. It's setting the font variant caps to small caps and all these other versions, all these other sub properties to normal, just as it would for another shorthand. And so this is what you typically see in a browser. This is what you'll see today in Safari Chrome or IE, um, where you're getting synthetic small caps. And it's kind of subtle, but you can sort of see how the, the, the capital A does not really match the color of the type on the rest of the line. It's, it's slightly thinner. And this is what a type designer has designed. These are the glyphs that are coming out of the font, specifically designed for small caps. And you can see how these much more closely sort of fit together. The capitals and the small caps work together. And this is very simple to specify. There's not really much to it. You're just saying small caps and the browser is picking up the small caps if they're available, and it's synthesizing it otherwise. Um, unfortunately, this is only supported in Firefox currently, and other browsers not yet. Again, this is another point where you should think about talking to your Microsoft representative. Uh, the font variant numeric um, property, this allows you to control exactly how uh, numbers look and typically the default for most fonts are to have proportional numbers so that when you see numbers within body text that it looks it sort of looks nice within that text within that context um, but when you have a table like this you can see where the digits don't really the places don't really line up very nicely so it would be have nice to have a way of monospacing um, these digits, and that's what the um, tabular uh, variations give you. They create a constant width for all the glyphs so that each one of the places line up nicely. And you'll also note that the, the font designer has, has decided that for the proportional, he's going to create a, an actually a different design for the glyph. See how the ones have more, are more pronounced? And that's sort of to fill out the space so that you, when you see this monospace version, it doesn't look like it has irregular spacing. So again, this is where the, the type designer is, you know, he's putting the effort in to make this text look good. Uh, this is the font variant East Asian sub-property. Um, here we're saying please use traditional, uh, traditional forms. Um, this is the word for uh, in Japanese for uh, university. And then um, sometimes like old established universities will like to display their name with a traditional character for university. Um, it gives them more of a, a flavor of, you know, we've been established and you know, we're very old, and very prestigious. Uh, this is how subscripts uh, look today on the web. Um, basically, the browser comes along and says, oh, you need subscripts. Okay, I'm going to shift around the digits and I'll make them a little bit smaller. And you can see that it's, I mean, it's sort of readable, but it's not really publishing quality. Um, this is what you get um, if a font designer sits down and says, okay, I'm going to design subscript glyphs for this uh, font. Um, and you can see again here on the digits, they're actually changing the design here so that it's more readable at the smaller size. But the one problem with this, oh, sorry, um, jumping ahead. Um, and these are superscripts, and this is an example where the browser, this is 
uh, for Minion Pro, so an Adobe font, a very well-designed Adobe font. Um, this is what a browser will give you for A squared. But if you take the um, superscript glyphs from the font, this is what you get. So this is, the, on the right side, is what a, a type designer has designed for you. So the ripple here is that when you use uh, the, the sub tag and the, oops, oh, editing error, uh, the sub tag and the sub tag, um, you're shifting around the vertical alignment. So you're moving around the line. And the problem is that, well, if you want to use the variance, then you want to get rid of this and use the variance. But then how do you get fallback on a browser that doesn't support it? And there's a very, this is a good point to uh, plug the at supports rule. I don't know if everyone's seen this. This is currently supported in Firefox and in Chrome. And um, IE is thinking about it, or it's under consideration. Um, so you say at supports, and then some part of a style rule, and then if the browser either doesn't know that, if it doesn't know the at support rules, it chucks it out. That's, that's basic CSS syntax. If there's an at rule that it doesn't understand, it just throws everything out. It doesn't try and do anything with it. And then if it does support this property, then you can simply set up your um, uh, sub tag so that you, el you eliminate the vertical alignment change and you eliminate the font size change and then you say use the variance. And then the way the font variant position property is defined if the font does not supply those uh, superscript uh, glyphs, it will automatically synthesize them for you. And so this gives you a very nice way of specifying something in a, in a progressive way so that if the browser supports it, you get it, but you don't have to sort of worry about whether is the font going to have these glyphs or not glyphs, um, because you don't want to end up in a situation where all of a sudden you've lost your, your superscript because the font doesn't support it. And a side effect of this, and you know, if you've ever looked at any page related to science on Wikipedia, um, you'll see this kind of thing where like, text tends to bounce around because of the use of superscripts and subscripts. And you can see here, you see how the line sort of at the bottom of the paragraph on the right column is, is sort of, it's not aligned with the stuff on the left, and it's sort of, it's got a larger line height. And that's basically because of all the jiggling that's going on dealing with the subscripts. So this is the way browsers do it in the existing way, but if you use the variance, this is what you get. You know, a type designer has designed the 5 and the 10 and the 5 there, but in addition, because it's just a normal glyph, and you're not varying the vertical alignment across the line, well, the lines match up. Okay, go back here, this is existing browsers, and you can see how at the bottom of the second column, you're sort of way out of sync of um, the, the left-hand column. Whereas here, you're, you've got everything consistent. Now if we go in and we just put, um, we make the text transparent and put an underline on anything, you can see it a little bit more clearly. This is the way existing browsers um, do super, superscripts and subscripts. You can see the, the lines don't really line up and they bounce around. And then this is with uh, superscript and subscript variants. You get something that's much nicer and much more consistent. So the one thing about this is that this is not structural. And by that I mean you can put anything into a sub or a super, a sub or a sub element. So you can put images, you can put, you can put an iframe if you want, and that will sort of be raised up by the line. And that's because of the way that the property is built, where it's using vertical align and shrinking the font size to get you that effect. Um, so things like nested, um, nested superscripts, or if you stick an image in there, and there's that, that Microsoft browser guy again. Sorry? <laughs> and there are a lot more of, there, there's a much larger set of features that really, you know, we, we, I, I don't have time to cover today. So check out the um, uh, dev docs on this on MDN.
Let's talk briefly about hyphenation. Uh, hyphenation, you know, I see a lot of people getting sort of frustrated sometimes. Well, gosh, it just text looks really lousy and I don't understand. You know, but we can do hyphenation. And sort of, if you look at, this is from the Kindle app. Um, and I, and I might, might add, this is the latest updated Kindle app, which supposedly has fixed this. But apparently they're still, the Kindle guys are still rolling out the fix to this. They're using fully justified text. No book looks like this. No book. This, this, this should not exist. And hyphenation is not easy, uh, sorry, it's not hard to specify. Um, the one ripple here is that it's, all three, sort of, all the browsers do it under, currently, under prefix. So you have to put in this, all this gobbledygook to make it work. And then the other key, key thing to point out is that you need to lang tag. Because hyphenation is driven based on the language. Because you need different dictionaries depending upon the language. But this is the one ripple. Everyone's popular, the, the popular browser, Chrome, does not support this. And I, I think basically they had some of the original WebKit hyphenation code in there, but it was only supporting manual hyphenation, which is using, an author basically has to do markup to make that work. Um, and so they just decided, oh, we're just going to pull it out, and then we'll, we'll figure out the right way to do it. But for whatever reason, it, it hasn't been a priority for them, which is unfortunate, because hyphenation would just be great to have, you know, across the board. This is without hyphenation. I took this from Safari. And then this is with hyphenation. And you can see how, like, you've got something that's much more readable because hyphenation is getting in there and filling out all the lines. Again, you know, you've got these lines where you've got one word on a, on a line. That's just, that's awful looking. And again, it's just something, if you set up the properties the right way, it'll just work. So I'm going to talk, just touch a little bit on color fonts. Um, and of course, these are uh, fonts that have glyphs that allow you to support multiple co colors within the glyph. And of course, the primary motivation is for emoji display. And any discussion of emoji kind of gets kind of, there's always these funny stories, I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but Instagram apparently, they banned uh, the ability to search on eggplants, the eggplant emoji, um, because it looks like something. Um, <laughs> so to support these uh, emoji fonts, unfortunately we have a situation where every single vendor has done something different. Um, so if you're on Android, if you're on an iPhone, if you're on Windows, you're all using a totally different font format to support emoji. Um, for uh, Apple was, of course, one of the, one of the first um, people to supply this, but men, there have been many of the Japanese um, uh, phone carriers that had their own standards and had their own internal formats. And basically, they're all the same. They're, they're all some form of bitmap, color bitmap that gets shown that, and where the, the font has multiple resolutions so that you can change to different resolutions and you see a bitmap that looks good. And the advantage of this is it's simple, it's fast, you don't have to really do a lot of work. Um, Microsoft recently has come out with a proposal that's kind of a little more interesting where they basically designed a format where the glyphs are designed in the, in the normal way an outline font is designed but they can assign colors. So you can have a palette of colors and different parts of the glyph will have, take on different um, colors from the palette. And then sort of, you know, a lot of people ragged on uh, Firefox for not supporting SVG fonts, but the reason we didn't want to support it was it's really duplicating a lot of what's in OpenType and it's much better to support OpenType, which has all these good features in terms of internationalization and customability and all this kind of thing. And so people sort of said, well, okay, why don't we make the glyph format be SVG? And that way you can take SVG and you can stick it into a glyph. 
And there's all sorts of restrictions on that. You can't have external references and all this kind of stuff. Um, and there's a restricted number of elements and that kind of thing. Um, but basically, you can, you can set up uh, a glyph, you, you have a glyph format where you can have animated, you can have gradients, you can have any kind of special effect that you have in SVG within the glyph of a font. And so this is a much more powerful format. Um, we sort of developed it along with Adobe, so there was a lot of sort of back and forth there to get something that was good. Um, unfortunately, it's only supported now on Firefox. Um, hopefully in the future people will think that this is a better thing, but you know, it's, again, it's, not, it's maybe not on everyone's higher priori highest priority. So the funny thing is that all of these formats, other than the Apple one, have been slated, are slated for inclusion in the open type spec. So there's no sort of, let's make this all work together so font designers can design one font that'll always work. It's sort of an MPEG problem where you're going to have, you know, the version for this platform and the version for that platform. And that's, that's going to make it really hard for authors to, sorry, for type designers to actually design fonts and for authors to use color fonts, unfortunately. So I think this sort of, you have to put this in the category of it's available, but it may not be the easiest thing to use at this point. So let's talk a little bit about font loading. And the first point to make here is, of course, that page responsiveness is the key to a good website. And this is not news to anybody here, but it's important to point out, because if you go back and look at the Vanity Fair example, you know, the first question really should be, do you really need all these fonts? You know, maybe you do, but maybe some designer somewhere is being persnickety about one, you know, his element on the page. And, you know, you, you need to put this into, you know, the context of, okay, you have all these resources that are on this page, which one of these has the highest priority? Or which one of these is most critical to the page design? And if all of these fonts, are needed on the page, well, then you just have to, to eat it. But I think the first question is whether you actually need all these fonts. The second thing is that you should know that WAF 2 is now available in Chrome, and it's also available um, in a future ver a, 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 it'll be in It'll be shipping with the version of the next release of Firefox that ships at the beginning of next month. Now, where WAF just represented very simple uh, zlib compression of individual tables, WAF 2 really gets into a lot of the font data and sort of pulls it all apart and puts it back together in ways that make it easier to compress. And so there's been a lot of work on this, both by Google and by Monotype, one of the large uh, font foundries. And so the results of that are against, for example, the Google Fonts corpus, they're roughly getting a an average of 30% better compression versus WAF. So that's another element that will help reduce the strain on a web page in terms of the number of fonts that you have. And the way you do the fallback for this is pretty easy. I'm showing you the, the non-EOT version of this, just the simple version. So you, you put the WAF2 with a format hint, you put the WAF2 URL with a format hint first, and then the WAF version, and the browser will, if it recognizes WAF2, it'll pull down that one, otherwise it'll pull down the WAF. And so that should just, with all existing browsers, other than IE7 and 8, blah, blah, um, that should just work. So let's talk a little bit about font loading behavior. Um, it's kind of hard in a, in a presentation like this to really cover all of the ins and outs of font loading. So I'm really touch on sort of only the highlights. And if you search around on font loading, you'll find a number of people putting together very good presentations about what various strategies that they have used to optimize um, fonts and what to display while, while you're seeing a page loading. <coughs> One of the exciting things is that there's now this uh, font loading API which is supported on Chrome and it's supported on Firefox under a flag. And once sort of the 
API stabilizes a little bit more, we'll be taking off that flag. So you'll at least have two browsers where you could use this API, which gives you explicit control over when fonts are loaded. So let's look at that just briefly. Um, this is a very simple at font face rule. And then this is the equivalent script that would um, do that. You simply create a new font face object. Um, you give it the family name and the URL. And then you add it to this new um, uh, font face set uh, element, uh, sorry, uh, item under the document. And this is th these two things are equivalent. So if you have it with an at font face rule, you don't need to add it. It's already in the, the uh, document.font. If you do it this way in script, you don't need the uh, at font face rule. And then um, there are messages so that you can actually explicitly say, I want to load this now. And you can load it, and then it'll give you back what something called a promise in JavaScript, which basically um, this is essentially a callback that says, OK, when the font loads, call this function. And then you can set up class names such that before you start loading, you say, OK, I'm loading now. And then after you complete the font load, you switch to loaded. And then you can set up styles that do whatever you want to do, that either hide the font or show the fallback font or, you know, it's really up to you. You can control that via CSS. So this very small chunk of script allows you to, to do that. And then when you have multiple fonts, you can of course begin to, uh, you can set up the script in a way such that you can say, okay, I want to wait for these three fonts, but I'm going to just load these other fonts and let them load whenever. If, if they don't show up for a while, that's okay. I'm not going to specifically uh, wait for them. So the idea is that you will now be able to explicitly control when the fonts load and you'll be able to control the display while loading. Now, this is, a, this is a script API, and I think the question now is, are, are there controls that we can put into CSS that can be used for this? Now, to some degree, uh, you know, part of me says, maybe this isn't something that's really needed. Maybe what's really needed is more standardization of the behavior of browsers. In other words, IE will immediately show the fallback font when you, have an, when you have a downloadable font on a page, whereas Safari will wait forever until the font actually loads. And a lot of the kvetching that you hear from people is when they're using their iPhone or you know, Safari and they're on a slow connection, they are waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And so if we could just say if we had more of what the, the Chrome or Firefox behavior would be, where you show for a limited amount of time nothing on the page, and then when it looks like the font's not going to load, you switch to the fallback font. That's sort of a more user-friendly way. If, that, if Safari was to adopt that behavior, would we really need these controls? I think that's an open question. Um, so one proposal is that we actually uh, set up a way of controlling the timeout per font. Um, I'm sort of of the opinion that we also need a preload hint. In other words, something that you could put in an at font face rule that says, okay, this I know I need on my page, I need it to start loading as soon as possible. So that you're not going, you're not suffering the consequences of the fact that at font face fonts are loaded lazily. In other words, right now you load the content of the page, you load the CSS, and then as layout begins, it starts to look at text and it realizes, oh, I need a font. And only at that point does it initiate the font load. So you've got this whole chunk of time from the time the page started to load to the time that layout started where none of, those, the, none of the fonts are loading at all. And so if this is a font that you really need to have on that page and you don't want to make users wait for it and you really want to try and avoid um, flashes of unstyled text as much as possible, then maybe it would help to have some sort of hint that would say, okay, you, you've seen this out font face rule, start loading this as soon as possible. But this is all under discussion. There's, you know, there are several proposals out there. People are talking about different ones, but I, I think there's, there's still sort of nothing set in stone at this point. I think that wraps it up for me. I'm a little bit early, but
Excellent. We got lots of questions, so sit okay. down. And Clarissa, if you want to set up your computer, you can start doing that. We had somebody complaining that it's very confusing if one speaker sets up while the other speaker is being interviewed. So now I will ask him to wave his hands every 30 seconds so the attention of the audience goes to him so nobody is confused about what Clarissa is doing. That's only one punishment I have for you. Oh dear. <laughs> Christian's mad at me. <laughs> Actually not, only that you, you showed the old fat photo of me, that's the problem. Oh, I was looking for that sugar picture, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we, we skipped this one. Um, so, there's a lot of questions about this, and a lot of them are screenshots of what things should look like, so these are really hard to question, unless I explain to you what they look like, so you go to Twitter and answer those later on as well, that's okay, your homework, it's not like you have another job. Um, <laughs> The biggest thing that a lot of people are actually asking is about font size, because a lot of the features that you showed are extra features in the font itself. So, I mean, I guess professional fonts will have those, but the ones that you get through, like the open font foundries, don't necessarily do have them, right? And how much bigger are fonts with the extra literatures and sub and all kind of beautiful things you've shown? Um, you know, they're only extra glyphs, so it. You know, usually it depends upon what you're comparing it to. If you're comparing it to a very stripped down font, yes, it will add in more glyphs. But many of these features aren't really applied to a huge number of glyphs. So the set of glyphs that have alternates is not, you know, the entire, it's not the full set of characters that are supported by a font. So, and typically when a type designer is designing these things, you know, today's type designers are putting in these features. Today's type designers are very aware of open type features, and it is something that is just standard. And in fact, you really have to go to people who are using older fonts um, to find ones that lack features. So. Or use like the not official ones, but some they found on the web and just implemented. Right. That's kind of a, you know, there's kind of a problem here about licensing, where there's this thing called an open font license that is, is basically an open source license for fonts that a lot of fonts ship with. However, if you go, for example, to Font Squirrel and you download a, a font package from them, they've actually they've, they've gone in and made modifications. Well, the terms of the, the license are really that you're supposed to change the name. So they really should say, you know, this is Gentium Font Squirrel. Because if you don't do that, then Somebody has this problem, which is exactly what you're saying, where maybe they're getting a mangled version, or they're getting a version where somebody decided to put a subsetting tool or, and has totally mangled the, the glyph ordering, in which case all the features could be ordered, reordered. Um, one of the things here, uh, uh, one of the things I like about the Google, uh, the Google Fonts service is that mm -hmm. it gives you like the functionality that you showed about the loading already right now because it lazy mm -hmm. loads the font so it puts the classes on the body right. uh, on the on the document root element while you're loading them and it also allows you to do a definition of what part of the font to use so you can say a range i only need the the numbers of that font and then it will only load that part of the font and not the rest is this something that is uh, thought of in, the in terms of scripts yeah. Yeah, sure. Is there something like that in the specification idea as well, that you don't include the whole font, but only parts of it? No, I think that's really a font, that's specifically a font design issue. Yeah. So, um, and a lot of services are getting very good about moving some of the features that would, you, you don't necessarily need to have the ability to flip between different features for a given font. You only want to say, okay, I want to make this modification to that glyph. And there's a type service, Huffler and Company, um, that has a cloud topography service, and it's just it's a very interesting read to just look over their page because um, they talk about a lot of these kinds of features where they specifically allow you to go in and say, okay, I don't want to have, I want to have, you know, I'm writing an app that's for children. I want to have numbers that are sort of more friendly to the way children will read, especially for like beginning learners or something. And so they'll they will they will. Um, it, as part of their service, they will ship you fonts that have certain features, you know, enabled or, or not by default. The, uh, the specification that you talked about, I haven't looked into it yet, the fonts, uh, uh, the fonts promise, 
as the event object, it gives you the name of the font, I guess. That's how you can distinguish between the different fonts being loaded and which ones to show when. Um, so you're, you're calling that method, it, you, you get back the, the, the font object that was being loaded. Okay. So you know the font resource that was being so loaded. So the name is the, then how to, how to distinguish between the ones which have been loaded when sure. rather than firing lots of promises one after another. Right. Okay. Um, hyphenation, uh, and I think that's the last thing that we have time for, it's language-based though. Yes. Because it, it's hyphenation in Firefox, for example, only work with English. No. So No? Now it, it's more We have 30 locales. Okay, awesome. Because in Germany it was a problem in the past. Uh, I think German, there might be licensing issues about, like I know we have problems with two specific locales. We have problems with um, English in the UK because there's whatever hyphenation library is out there, there are special licensing, you know, stuff around some of that, those files. But it's not, you know, for a company, for example, of Google size, they could sit down and, and pay somebody to, to work on hyphenation. Dictionaries. Which was a question, actually. What do you do with Chrome with hyphenation? What do you think of the JavaScript libraries out there that do it instead? I haven't really tried them, so I can't offer an opinion, but I wouldn't think it would be that hard to sit down and simply say, okay, well, let's, let's load in these libraries and then do the hyphenation ourselves. But in terms of performance, it sounds to me like a terrible idea. Um, you know, again, you're talking about text rendering, and text rendering in all browsers these days on modern CPUs is, is relatively fast. If you're talking about something that happens, you know, 60 frames a second or something, if it's in like an animation, okay. Maybe you don't want to turn on animation. Maybe you don't want to turn on hyphenation when you're animating the size of a paragraph. But if it's basically static on the page, I, I don't think you're really talking about a huge performance. Mm. Uh, a lot of talks about uh, design in CSS and a lot of font talks are about SVG and I guess there was a lot of flashback that SVG fonts were not supported and you said like let's go for that's, the open that's type. That's really an old issue. That's, yeah. you know, a, a lot of the reason the SVG fonts were supported was, you know, the original, um, some of the original downloadable font implementations on, on iOS only supported SVG fonts. And so people, to be able to support iPhones, had to have a SVG font version. But it's a relatively inefficient format. You're essentially sending, as opposed to a binary blob, you're sending, a, you know, an XML file. Yeah. You know, and you can compress that, but, you know, it's still relatively bulky. It gets stored in memory. It's a DOM somewhere. I mean, there's just all these problems with it. But it does support multicolor fonts. Um, sure, but one, you can just use a graphic. Yeah. Or um, you can use, you know, something which we've proposed, which is SVG and OpenType. One last question was that uh, nested sub-elements, uh, how, how do they deal with, uh, with line height? What do you... I don't know what I mean, because it's somebody else. Uh, <laughs> if we use n nested subtags underneath each other, will the line height still be the same? Um, so the... If you set the line height as a function of the font size, then it should work, but you don't want to do that. Like, you don't want to worry about that stuff. <laughs> Excellent. And of course, are there any plans for Google and Apple to support all these font variant features? I think you should answer for Google and Apple right now. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I found to, to, to roll this off, uh, to finish this off, what we found in, in Microsoft Edge, which is the browser that I support, so all the IE features, as weird as they ask me about this, um, is that we had to, uh, to, uh, to display fonts that didn't have the course header look up because Chrome and Safari don't do that look up. So a lot of fonts on the web, okay, the idea is that a font gets uh, needs to get a course header certification to make sure that you're allowed to use it. And uh, uh, IE and MS Edge actually wanted to do that because you don't want to just I, install. I, I, think, I think a better way to describe it, maybe some of the people in the audience don't really understand what you're talking about, but Basically, you can't cross-link the fonts unless there's a header coming back from the server that says it's okay to cross-link to this font. Exactly. So it's, it, it, the implementation is fine for this site to use right. that font, so and, to and say. And this gets into this, there's kind of a long-standing argument about whether this was, you know, if we could go back to the 
original design of the web where images, you can link to an image from any site, is that really a great thing or, you know, there's just a lot of issues for that, you know. Isn't there also a potential danger in fonts being binary data for malware injection? Um, I think you can already get that in other forms, so I wouldn't say there's Well, that any... doesn't mean that it's not a, an issue, so. <laughs> You know, with any feature on the web, one more feature is another attack surface, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an issue, but a much bigger problem are just, you know, like the, the sad people on XP that, you know, are not getting any security updates. Yeah. And the thing to keep in mind is that fonts on a lot of Windows platforms, you know, they're essentially, the data is being mucked about at a very, you know, high level, high security level within the OS. And so if there's a bug in that code, then the ease with which that can be turned into a secure, in, into a privilege escalation, is very easy. And that's a big danger. So make sure you know where your fonts are coming from before you implement them. Yes. Thanks very much. Yep.